Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to consider the long history of urbanism through the study of art. And so my talk this evening is entitled Urban Art, the First 6,000 Years. My name is Monica Smith, and I'm a faculty member at the University of California, Los Angeles, in the departments of anthropology and in the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And in a recent book called Cities, the First 6,000 Years, I thought about the ways in which cities grew and developed over time. Of course, when we think about art as a way of understanding the first urban developments, Art is not unique to cities. People were making art for 30 or 40 or 50,000 years, and they were making art in a variety of ways. They were making art that went on walls. They were making art that could hold in their hands. They were also making architecture, which is, of course, another form of art. And so we have freestanding monuments like Stonehenge, and we also have caves all over the world that are also decorated with art and the depictions of animals and other kinds of iconography. But when it comes to cities, the range and type and diversity of art exploded in a whole variety of different ways. And when we think about, for example, the use of personalized art, one of the things that comes to mind is fashion. And we know that Fashion Week is always in a city someplace. It's in New York or Milan or London. And the idea of urban fashion is often something that is not necessarily intensely practical, but is also something that is made for show and for celebration. Another kind of urban art and architecture is in the form of big celebratory spaces. So places like ballparks and theaters are places that only urban centers can support because those are the only places where you're going to get thousands and thousands of people coming together for a ball game or for some other kind of event. We also know that urban music can be very distinctive. And again, it's that sense of the audience and a large amount of participation, but also the freedom and creativity to develop many different and diverse kinds of musical repertoires. And finally, there is urban cuisine as another form of art that all of us can partake in so that the development of art is not something that's limited to these big monumental structures or very fancy kinds of outfits, but something that people can participate in as they live their daily lives in urban places. So is all of that new, that development of food and cuisine and art and participation in music? Absolutely not. We know from the archaeological record that the exact same processes were happening in cities from the very beginning of urban life more than 6,000 years ago. Today in this talk, what I'd like to do is highlight three aspects of urban art that we can see as a continuity between the past and the present. Big art, small art, and art that is challenging. Let's start with big art. When we think about ancient cities, what we have is a kind of development of urban public spaces and monumental architecture that are also the venues for decoration and for political aggrandizement through imposing a style on the city. And as you can see here from these artistic depictions of Mesopotamia, the whole idea of even very practical things like gateways and streets and fortress walls are things that also come with a kind of decoration and urban art making through monumental architecture. Everywhere around the world where we have these kinds of practical things that define cities, we see that there is a kind of style that is made possible in the landscape through the large scale planning and infrastructure of political authorities who shape cities through designs that involve large amounts of labor for the creation of things like city walls and canals, palaces and open places that then make an urban center very distinctive and that you can also sense when you walk into them. So even as an ordinary person going into an ancient city, you would feel that sense of belonging as you walk through the very substantial ramparts and fortress walls that get you into the heart of the city. When we excavate, we often find things that are broken, 
But when we have some help from people in the digital world to be able to recognize what buildings look like before they fell apart, what we can see is that this sense of urban grandeur and decoration is something that would have been seen and participated in by people all over the city as they moved around on their daily business rounds. But of course, there's always someone in charge. And when you think about big architecture and big art in ancient cities, it was because of the capacity of political leaders to pull together the massive amounts of people and materials in order to be able to make those big architectural expressions possible. But of course, a city is not just about the big things that are made by political leaders. They're also about the small things that people make and carry around for themselves. We know that ancient cities were full of the kinds of producer consumer opportunities that resulted in many more different kinds of opportunities for consumption. And when we excavate an ancient city, wherever it is in the world, we find a tremendous amount of trash because that's what people were doing. They were consuming large amounts of goods and they were throwing away large amounts of goods. So we might think that modern trash making is some kind of 21st century behavior. I can assure you as an archeologist that every city that we have ever looked at is full of discards because there's this kind of rapid churn of production and consumption and discard that results in a lot of different kinds of opportunities of people to engage in different kinds of art making. And that's through things like personal ornamentations, as well as the designs and shape and form of the everyday pottery that they were using in their homes. In fact, the diversity of consumption in an ancient urban environment is something that we can compare to the development of the ways in which we now access lots and lots of different material goods through the internet. So what I've proposed in the book is that cities were kind of like the first internet. In other words, they provided that kind of long tail of availability of being able to go someplace and find a whole variety of different and diverse goods that were not available anyplace else because in a village the amount of different kinds of goods and the size of the market was very very small and that's something that we can still experience today the diversity of consumption that you get in a city compared to a rural place we should remember that this production and consumption cycle was something that was exciting, not only for consumers to be able to consume lots of different kinds of goods, but it was also great for producers. And so producers are drawn into cities because they can make a whole variety of things. In fact, producers can even make some things that are kind of weird and experimental because in a village, you have relatively few consumers and people probably can't always take a chance on something that's very unusual. But in a city, there are so many more people who are out there that you're always going to find somebody for that cutting edge aspect of a creation that you're putting together. What we found in our excavations at the ancient city of Shishpalgar, which I've been undertaking with my colleague R.K. Mahanti from India, what we've seen is that there is a tremendous diversity of material items, exactly like any other city, we find a huge amount of discards. But we also see that there's a tremendous variety of things that people were making, producing, and throwing away that they were part of in their everyday lives of fashion and being out on the ancient streets and engaging in their own artistic ways of being an urban dweller. The way that we've seen this most distinctly is in the terracotta ornaments that we have recovered by the hundreds in the excavations at this ancient urban site. And these are really the cheapest possible form of ornamentation that you can imagine. They're made out of clay in a mold. So the mold would be decorated. And then somebody, even an untrained person could just put the clay in over and over again. And these could be churned out very cheaply by the hundreds. But they also have a lot of different decorations. So if you see here, the range of things includes geometrics and florals and animal designs and all different kinds of swirls and so on. So that there was a tremendous variety 
variety of these terracotta ornaments that were available in the market. And they included things like bangles and finger rings and ear ornaments and pendants. And so you had this opportunity to consume very small things in very large quantities. And when the style changed, so that it came from geometric to floral to animals, that last year's style would just get taken right off and thrown in the trash. That sense of art making through consumption and producers being aware of fashion and styles is something that we can see in even the most basic things that we recover in ancient archaeological sites. We can even say that the development of these consumer goods provides people an opportunity to look around at what's in the market and to engage in what Silverstein and Fisk have called trading up. So in other words, you might spend a little bit more in some category because you want your bling to be more visible, or maybe it's your clothing that you end up spending a little bit more on, or maybe there's something about hairstyles that you end up spending more money on. The idea about consumer goods is that the consumption of art, labeling, branding, all of those kinds of things are things that we see even in the most ancient cities where there is so much variety of the small goods that people purchase that are all decorated. And we can see with our modern example, they're all coffee, right? But the type of thing that we consume is a way of us to say something about ourselves as we're walking around with that brand of cup. And that is something that also goes back to a very early part of urban life that people like to see and be seen with the right kind of accoutrement. But there is also art that is challenging. And when we think about the development of urban art and architecture from the standpoint of that big art. That big art is saying something beyond decoration. It's saying something beyond infrastructure. Big art is about the power of those who are installing it. And here in this depiction, you can see how the size of the structure is really meant to make people feel small. And before urban centers, you didn't have this kind of big monumental grandeur that was also making a political point. But of course, that's not unique to ancient times. We have seen the same kind of impulse over and over again in cities where there is a program of clearance in order to be able to bring in something new and grandiose, like this monument to Vittorio Emanuel Due in Rome that is a 20th century creation. When you look at it by itself, it looks very big and important. When you look at it as part of the long history of Roman urban life, it's just another layer on a city that has endured for centuries. And then there is the kind of urban art that seems to be making some kind of point, but that may be confusing or maybe even ironic. Uh, in other words, you've got art that is challenging because there is some push and pull of political authority and symbolism that may not be clear to everybody. And you also have urban art that's being challenged by people who are wearing it and who are speaking back to people in positions of authority. So that this kind of fashion, the leading edge, the edginess of urban music, these are all things that are being generated in cities at the level of ordinary people who are electing what to wear, what to listen to, what to carry around with them, that is part of that dynamic of being in a city where it's not just about top-down activities, it's also about the ways that people create their lives with the material goods that are decorated, that they have with them and that they take home with them. In public places, what this means is that there's often a clash between the political intent of big art and the bottom-up sentiment of small art that results in ongoing dynamic conversations 
of the kind that we're seeing happening in modern cities and that we can also see in ancient cities where we have things like graffiti or vandalism that is a way of demonstrating against the art that is being imposed from the top down. So this sense of urban art, the things that you only get in cities are part of this long history of urban life and that helps to make cities the dynamic places that they are. So that cities are the places where we are going to continue to generate this intensity of artistic feeling, the ubiquity of art and the tenacity of art as a way for people to connect and to be part of the urban environment. So we can say that urban art is not the end. Thank you very much.